Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga and this is episode number 627 of the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host Agostino Zynga, episode number 627, how you doing, how you feeling, great, amazing, how am I, you know, doing well with all the time I have available to me. The funny thing is about that little intro song that just played, the funny, funny thing about that intro song that just played that I've been playing since maybe episode number 300 ish for the last four years i jacked that little instrumental from the one and only asap rocky produced by kelvin crush one of my favorite producers up there with the pierre borns and whatnot especially with these um, new school guys and it was one of those tracks i remember hearing asap rocky maybe perform maybe in primavera or it may have been a festival I saw him play after we went to see him play at Primavera. Another people went to go see Primavera. But I do remember it being one of the tracks that he played during his live show. Because, you know, Asa Rocky is kind of notorious for being pretty sparse in terms of his releases. He doesn't drop every year. so But he obviously gets booked a lot to perform live. So I guess to fill out his sets and to build up anticipation, he, you know, does what he usually does and plays his bangers, but then also slips in the odd tune that he's working on to kind of gauge the reaction of the crowd. Now, some of those songs never come out, right? There's a song that he's got with Playboy Carti that he's been playing for ages that hasn't come out yet, probably isn't going to come out. There's that song that he recorded a video for with Playboy, with Playboy Carti that was only out on YouTube and hasn't actually come out on any sort of like, you know, um, digital streaming service or platform, whatever it may be. And then I assumed that um, Shit In Me, the track that he's got out now at the moment, would be one of those tracks. But unfortunately, due to this week's activation and rollout, it seems like it's a legit single in the lead up to his new album dropping, I'm assuming, first quarter of next year. So I'm probably going to have to change my flipping intro music of my podcast because the man that created it dared to flip and release the album or release the single. I'm so annoyed. But the dream is to, the dream is one day to get flipping Kelvin Crush and to have the money to afford Kelvin Crush to produce a, a flipping podcast intro for me, or if all you know if all works out good, just buy a, like a little throwaway track from flipping Pierre Bourne and use that and cut that up and use that as an intro, maybe some outro music. That'd be pretty cool going forward. But yeah, it's looking like I'm probably gonna have to you know change that intro music soon. So if you've got used to it and you've enjoyed it these past couple of years. Or these last few years actually because I'm, I'm pretty sure i started using it four years ago when the actual leak happened or when he actually previewed it in a live show you know enjoy the last few days of it because i'm probably gonna have to change it unfortunately because the person who made it originally has dared to put it out officially how dare they how dare they talking about primavera and talking about that incredible incredible festival i wanted to mention this because i don't think i covered this prior regarding their new festival for 2023 and the lineup and the idea behind it is pretty cool, I think, all in. I know there's been some complaints I've seen online about Primavera Sound Festival 2023 because they're essentially holding it um, in Barcelona and Madrid on consecutive weekends. So I think first weekend is Barcelona, second weekend is in Madrid. And the lineups are meant to mirror each other with a few additions here and there. But the thing why people are getting annoyed is that the Madrid location, if I'm not mistaken, isn't actually in Madrid. It's like on the outskirts and there isn't any like amenities or anything near it so you're kind of having to travel in and out of madrid to kind of go there and from what i've heard also that time of year is incredibly 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 hot and i'm assuming if i'm also read correctly that that place where they're going is pretty much sparse there's nothing else there so there's going to be the sun just beating down on you while you're out in the festival way 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 away from any kind of help and way away from anywhere kind of shops or anything so you're basically essentially having to stay the whole day there getting absolutely burned in your skull and not having any place to rest and chill out which is what makes actually primavera sound festival in barcelona special because that park that a forum is one of the best venues to just chill and hang out and they have so many amazing water fountains and they have this really big food court and loads of bars and they have guys actually they have loads of they have a food court that's huge they have bars everywhere. They have places where you can fill up your bottle to get water, like a fountain, essentially. They have toilets located all over the place. There's little places where you can go and kind of chill out and unwind and relax. And then the other thing I was going to mention, oh, and then the other thing also, if you don't want to go to the bar, you know, there's always that annoying person in the group. It's probably me. 
who wants to nip off to the toilet for you know what or who wants to go to the bar in the middle of a set so there's always um those guys and i, I think they have them in most spanish cities anyway especially tourist cities and i think each city is different i think barcelona is a mix between chinese and like indian pakistani type looking guys and other parts of you know um, spain could be other maybe groups of immigrants but essentially they are the ones who are the, um, selling beers out of the kind of out of a backpack or like a cooler and they come around to you they use they're obviously sponsored by or kind of endorsed by people like heineken and stuff but they essentially come around with their little cooler and sell them to people and stuff so you don't have to literally move out of the crowd you can literally just find somebody and they usually got this massive bag with a flag on top so you can kind of spot them from anywhere and kind of buy your drinks as you need be so it's a fairly fairly easy and really kind of hospitable festival so i can imagine if they put something down in terms of going to Madrid and going on the outskirts, I can imagine why people are annoyed because one thing Primavera does really well is making it really comfortable for you to kind of be there and have a good time. But let's read the article. This is courtesy of, of NME. Um, it says Primavera Sound Festival 2023, Blur, Depeche Mode, Kendrick Lamar, Rosalia announced a he headline. Imagine that. Blur, Kendrick, Depeche Mode, Rosalia. That's already a good enough lineup for most London festivals. And they've got plenty more people that are allowed to add to that. So it says the Primavera Sound Festival has announced its lineup for 2023 with Depeche Mode, Blur, Kendrick Lamar and Rosalia and more to headline. The 2023 installment um, of the festival, which will take place in both Barcelona and Madrid, will also feature headliners including Halsey, FKA Twigs, Str Skrillex, St. Vincent, The Moldy Peaches, Calvin Harris, which will be a banger of a set. He's got so many bangers. Imagine hearing him on the festival. Wow. And La Tigre. Pet Shop Boys will also perform on Wednesday, which is a free day, while the festival is also set to welcome the likes of Turnstile, Amazing, Arlo Parks, Maniskin, uh, Pink Pantress, which, oh, come on, this is going to be so much fun, I have to go, Christine and the Queens, Fred again, um, who I've obviously been a new convert to, Caroline Palachek, which would be sick, because she's going to be dropping a new album at the top of the year, I think sometime in Valentine's Day, I remember reading, so that should be cool, The Void and Japanese Breakfast, who, you know, she's she's a bit annoying as a person but she does make great music so i'm really really looking forward to that earlier this year primavera sound announced the festival will take place in both barcelona and madrid for the first time sharing in a press statement that it, the two cities will mirror each other on two consecutive weekends taking place at the Parc de la forum in barcelona on june the first to third and a ciudad del rock in arganda del rey in madrid in from june 8th to 10th in total, there will be over 200 performers in each city, which will feature a shared lineup shared um, 620 kilometers apart, with a few small exceptions. The Peshman's headline performers will mark their stage comeback after five years. The press statement of the festival says, look for the, but yeah, we don't want to learn about the flipping press release. Let's actually look at the lineup in great detail. Absolutely madness in it. Ghost are always a great performer to see live also. NX Worries, Anderson Pack and Knowledge, that would be absolutely banging if you aren't already familiar with those guys and those mixtapes that they put out. Um, I don't know what you're doing. Turns out I'll be sick to watch live. Pusha T, Rima. Now, you know what? Um, I was thinking next year of actually what festival I wanted to go to and I had written down on my list, do Prima and obviously do, um, what's that one I went to go to last year but I ended up chicken out of it. I forgot the name of it. Um, Houghton, that's the one. So both of those are going to require camping. They're going to require holidays and stuff. But I'm going to save my my dates and definitely make sure that I go to both of those things because I think there'll be things that I'll look back on in a year and think, you know what, that was worth it. But it's going to obviously require me having to like, you know, stop going out on a weekly basis and save some money to go see things. But so far, this is looking awesome. Um, look, this kind of loyal kind of guy, I'm not a fan at all. Um, Drain Gang will be sick. Central C to C Live will be sick. I've never seen him perform live, so I'll be interested to see what his performance is like. Um, Black Country would be nice, Boris would be nice, Off Performing, Wow, Perfume, uh, Pink Pantress, Red Velvet, Self Esteem, got Brutalism playing also, it's going to be really good man, some nice DJs here also included, and then you've got on the, let's actually make it smaller than I can zoom in, and then you've got on, oh look at that, that is, I wonder if he does this on purpose, because I'm looking at the dates now, You've got June the 3rd. Yeah, you've got June 1st, 2nd, and 3rd. On June 2nd, you've got Kendrick Lamar headlining, and then you also got Baby Keem. I wonder, because they're family, and obviously they're signed to the same label, I wonder if Kendrick Lamar is doing this amazing thing where like, he uses his platform and his notoriety and fame to essentially always get Baby Keem gigs. 
So whenever he's performing somewhere, Baby Keem has to perform with him. It's just part of the package deal. It's part of the deal. So you can't book Kendrick Lamar by himself. You have to book him on his own. But if you want to book Baby Keem by himself, you can. Because obviously it's going to, he's happy to see his family member do well for himself. But either way, I'd love to see Baby Keem perform live, to be fair. I'm really impressed by him. Forte, I can do it out. Um, Fred again, Skrillex, Moldy Peaches, Bad Religion, Bleachers, Christina and the Queens, Mora, Sparks. Christina and the Queens is going to be a splendid live set. I think they're going to be really good live. Um, I think, you know, I'm a big, real big fan of their flipping albums. They got some really good album cuts, deep, deep, deep ones that I play in my DJ sets from time to time. Um, so I'm really going to be interested to see them. Uh, I'm not too sure who this person is. It's Israel Fernandez E. Diego Del Mora. I wish to see who that person is. Not no John Talbot's playing awesome. You got Karate Cool. You got Lebanon Hangover. How oh, sorry, Lebanon Hanover. Sorry. You got Nation of Language, Swans, Thames. Oh, amazing Delgados, uh, Unwood, VTSS back to back with LS, LSDXOX. That'll be nice. Eve's Tumor is playing. Oh my God. And then on the last day, to round everything off, because usually the last day is amazing also because they have this great DJ that we remember we saw um, who always plays at the last set at the end. I forgot his name. If you remember, if you've been to Primavera, you definitely know what I'm talking about. And he plays in like the main, one of the main kind of stages on the side towards the end. It's our last ever performance. And it's so fun because there's loads of edits and mashups of like indie tracks or like, you know, popular pop music or dance records that you've heard throughout the years. Um, but yeah, last day, you got Rosalia, you got Calvin Harris, FK Twigs, Manaskin, St. Vincent, The War on Drugs, <laughs> Caroline um, Palaszczuk, Charlotte the Wit, we can skip that, she's shit, Maggie Rogers, My Morning Jacket, Toxi, Tox, 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 Toxiska, that's that reggaeton girl, I'm assuming that's got the OnlyFans, right, I'm assuming that's her, when I kiss Madonna, Arlo Sparks, Death Grips, Domi and JD Beck, Eddie Palmieri, Ezra Furnham, Gillaband, Holly Humberston. That's definitely that's the whitest name I've seen in my life, isn't it? Holly Humberston. Uh, Jada G, Jockstrap, John Cale, JPEG Mafia, Peggy's there, Mad One, Laurie Anderson, Nia Archives, who I've seen everywhere over the last couple of weeks, so maybe we could see them. Over Mono, Shelak, Surf, um, Curse, The Voids, Young Lean, Whoever this person is with all the flipping, you know, numbers and digits and shit. And then, yeah, Ablo, Ablo Emerson is playing as well. CCO, DJ Coco. Is that the one? Maybe I think that's a person. Maybe it's DJ Coco is a person who plays last. It sounds familiar. It might be DJ Coco. He's the last person who plays. You got Um Unit, DJ Fitz. Whoever that person is. You got Twin. You got Drift Inside. But yeah, the lineup looks absolutely incredible. You've also got Diplo. Um, on one of the days as well playing you know but that lineup looks absolutely horrendous ben Bauma, camel fat diplo and purple disco machine no thank you but the rest of the lineup looks absolutely splendid so i'm definitely going to add this to my list of places to go and i cannot wait because this is going to be fun because i've done i've done all the experiences i think when it comes to premiere i've done the hotel done the airbnb so it'd be nice just to kind of go there and kind of mix things up on the side. But one thing I did notice and realize when you go there, you have to be very conscious of not picking somewhere too far away from the venue. It doesn't necessarily matter to, for the most part, but when you're going back, all the cabs are taken. It's a long walk back. The public transports are rammed and you're just messed up and usually tired and you just want to sleep. So it, it depends. Usually people try and get their accommodation nearer to the venue. I like to have mine a little bit far away. I think last time we went there, we stayed in like the, the Gothic Quarter or something, right? Downtown, which is quite far from where the venue actually is. And not far, but it's like you have to travel, I think, 40 minutes or something to get there. But I guess if you budget in to have some money for cabs and stuff and whatever, it won't really matter because you just go back and forth all the time because the main city centre, you can walk around everywhere. You don't need to go on any sort of public transport. And the food, obviously, in Barcelona, you guys will probably know if you've been to Spain, Barcelona food is like incredible. Like I think overall... I think I've had more fun in Madrid as a city. I think it's probably well, much more well-rounded. I thought if you want to go and party, you can go and party. If you want to go and see some countryside-esque landscape, you can go and do that. If you want to do some sightseeing, you can do that. If you want to shop, you can do that. Whereas I feel like Barcelona is more so just a, like a commerce and bar and restaurant type area. But, oh, so city. But there's no denying the restaurants are smacking. I remember we went out there and when we went out there for the most part, 
there was some research done before in terms of bars and restaurants to go to especially in our area but what we did was that we just picked places on TripAdvisor or something or google maps that had a that had a maybe let's say three or four stars plus and everywhere we went to with no exception they were all splendid all of them were splendid all of them were flipping out of this world the one place i remember that was actually really cool that i realized was this bar that i think i remember seeing i think it's a cool bar in barcelona it was like a wooden type bar it might have had some name like a ghost or something it had a really cool logo and i just remember them just giving me a glass of whiskey that was like free pork because obviously them bad boys over there they know what they're doing so you always get a little bit extra on top so it's not like you know in london where you're flipping being bumped with the flipping drinks and it's all flipping measured exactly they give you a nice free pour and i remember they smashed or they lumped in the mass the biggest flipping cube of, of ice i've ever seen that was cut to perfection like and it actually just fit right inside the flipping diameter of the flipping or circumference sorry, of the glass and it was just it fit snugly in there they pour the whiskey in there and it just sort of melted the edges a little bit and the glass was already chilled too that's one thing as well that you have to give those guys credit for in spain yeah. because obviously it's so warm over there i'm assuming they have a really good culture of just having fresh drinks like the soft drinks are really nice um they have good snacks and stuff they just know how to do that thing really well and one thing they always do every bar you go to they'll always have the glasses um chilled especially if you're ordering a pint or you're ordering i think it's called a i think it's like i think it's called a pincher no, is it a pincher i forgot what it's called um tortado or something i think it's tortado. it's like these little glasses of beer that you order and they're usually always chilled and they taste especially when you're out in the sun and i'm not really a beer guy not by choice because you know my body doesn't respond well to uh, wheat and stuff like that it goes a little bit crazy but when i could drink beer heavily god damn it there's nothing more tastier than i'll you know spending half of the day or maybe most of the day out you know listening to music you know pinging your eyes off you know <laughs> walking around and stuff being social and you're flipping tired and then going and grabbing a flipping chill drink there's nothing better than that honestly it's nothing nothing better than that and i can't wait to do it again so yeah, Pure Reverse Sound 2023 is looking like an absolute movie. I'm definitely going to make sure that I can get out there 100%. No way, no doubt in that one. No way, no doubting that one. So, moving on, we're going to talk about this. So, this was courtesy of Hypebeast, and it's featuring the Virgil Abloh Co's um, courtesy of Architect exhibition that happened in Art Basel, Miami, which just happened, I think. It's already all finished. So the reason why this stuff is obviously important is because for the most part, Virgil's legacy also is just in incredible work ethic. He left behind so many, you know, incomplete and half complete projects that are still being kind of churned out now to this day. So when they went, when they did this exhibition, they put this together, there was obviously an opportunity for them to kind of showcase some of the models that are due to come up that we haven't actually seen coming up maybe in the future. And obviously Hypers were able to take um, some pictures of the exhibition and show us. But I'll quickly read you the, uh, the, the text before we go to the pictures. It says, set to officially open on December the 1st. We now have an inside look at the Virgil, the codes, courtesy of architects of exhibition. Um, taking place during Zion Miami, the limited shoe showcase, the, sorry, the limited time showcase, represented by Nike and VA Securities, and has taken over the city's Ruber Museum. According to Nike and VA Security, the exhibition honors Virgil's creative legacy, highlighting his long term partnership with Nike and shares the design methodologies that were central to his creative identity. The exhibition and its related program are designed to showcase these methodological uh, principles known as ABLO codes, which are meant to be applicable to any medium, product or space. The codes made his work, and particularly the 10 with Nike, both easily identifiable and transferable. I'm wondering, or translatable, I'm wondering, right, if there's ever going to be a time in the future where somebody really smart who can program is going to be able to put together some sort of AI that can essentially churn out Virgil level ideas. You know how everyone's going crazy with this chat AI thing going on at the moment where you can essentially input um, certain parameters like, you know, maybe you're saying, hey, I want to write an article about the downfall of sneakers in 2023. And then this uh, chat AI will churn out, you know, a, a flipping one sheet of the downfall of the print sneakers in 2023. Like people are going crazy and being really creative with it. People are, you know, making briefs. People are doing Q&As, um, four bits of code. Like it's crazy what they're doing with it. I wonder, given all the information about Virgil's out there, given the countless amounts of hours of content he's recorded, I wonder if it's possible 
to kind of get all that information, get some of his tenets, some of his principles, and put all those into an AI and sort of allow it to sort of be able to present virtual level ideas. Maybe not in, maybe text is probably the wrong way. Maybe it is the easiest way to do it. Because I don't, actually, it's not. I rewind because there's the other AI at the moment where you can churn out images and it kind of gives you, you know, I think someone did an image of like people that didn't exist from like the 80s that were at some metal show or something so that would be pretty cool going forward i wonder if that could be a thing anyway continue with the article helping mark design miami this year the exhibition will serve to express the codes that guide and shape the future of nike partnership with the virgil's ablo securities informing the ongoing collaboration in output established by the architect by architect sorry architecture that's his um platform that he's got um helmed with mahus and who by mahus Mahfouz and Chloe Sultan architect's future project will reflect on and interpret the code according to Nike the goal is to further Ablo's legacy and individual practice and to establish the framework for an enduring open source institution and invitation to design the anchored in inspirational storytelling so let's go up and just look at the image because these are the most important things right because we've already spoken about some of the stuff virtual Ablo security is doing in the future so pick up Shannon Ablo and all those things moving forward so so far from what we've seen in this picture here which showcases the variations of the air force ones we've seen these these are the complex air force ones right if i'm not mistaken if i'm not mistaken the ones on the left hand side those were the shoes that he might have did with essence you remember when he was at he went to essence um studio i think or something and he present he i think he was doing some sort of live video collaboration i forgot where it was and he was like drawing on all the soul this is when he was doing all that stuff on the midsoles and i still do that to this day so you know respect to his legacy and rip to the goat but i think that was part of that if i'm not mistaken you've got the complex air force ones here with a silver foil then you've got um, I forgot what the black ones are called, but you got the black ones, you got the blue, these are part of the gallery ones, I guess they're dropping in terms of gallery exhibition. So all three of these are already dropped. And then the ones here, which are kind of following the example of the kind of the hiking system, whatever it's called, lacing that goes on top, which is pretty cool. I don't think it works the greatest on Air Force Ones, if I'm completely honest, in terms of the silhouette. Maybe it's a bit too bulky for that, but I do like that they've done it. They've got it in a blue. Um, with the different heel type color here in terms of white you've got it in the yellow and you've got it in this kind of fuchsia pinky type of color and i also do like the addition of the black midsoles and i guess the cool thing about this is that you can imagine him sitting down and just churning out colorway after colorway and i think that's one, one thing i remember that french guy um who was who owns a car dealership uh, he was talking on complex about Virgil and saying that how there's so many other cool colors and stuff that he's done that probably never see the light of day and the reason why I reckon that's possible is because of his design approach uh, or his you know methodology his practice the way he kind of approaches it he kind of did it in some sort of there's, there's probably some sort of math, math, mathematical equation behind it or some really strict parameters that he used and then you just kind of input color input color and just kind of you know use your eye and your senses to determine what kind of hits and what doesn't but you can churn out so many whereas if you're a proper sneakerhead like i am and you're you know you're obsessed with this stuff to the point where it gets crazy you can really obsess over minor and insignificant details and it kind of drives the thing crap you know i mean it makes it dead it doesn't really spark any new ideas and you don't necessarily churn out a lot of colorways because you're more worried about the mud guard you're worried about the flipping material of the heel tab you're worried about what the lace tips look like when actually if you focus on just getting the base colorways done the materials will kind of make sense after the fact and you can kind of you know churn through and run through many more ideas my favorite of these that haven't come out so far definitely be these all green pine green type looking numbers here with the classic silver swoosh and the you know overstitch on your on it and obviously the kind of off-white beaverton stamp on the inside and then also this purple number here they look beautiful and whatever this color is also this is like i don't know if this is like an orange or a mud whatever it may be it's quite translucent it's got like a translucent heel tab translucent sole with the area on it is pretty cool and the funny thing is, if I'm not mistaken, Air Force Ones do have a concealed air bubble, but it's something that not a lot of people kind of actually even know anything about, especially because Air Force Ones never really were about showing the bubble. So I've always liked the addition of this air on the midsole with the quotation marks. Helps to give the shoe a little bit of a Air Maxi type of feel, even though they're the complete opposite of what you would describe a traditional Air Max One to be, or an Air Max in general. But I do like the look of those, 100%, 100%. 
then we move on we've got a showcase of dunks these dunks to this day i have to be honest i never really liked them um, I know a lot of people went crazy for them and I think the idea behind them and the approach and the ability to put all these essentially limited edition shoes with various slight variations behind them out and into people's hands was awesome to see. Um, I find it funny how when Virgil was alive he took offense to the fact that people were doing mock-ups of the colorways and they weren't that impressive considering how much he smashed the first collaboration with Nike 10 and he took it as a bit of an offense but if anything I think now that he's passed and some time has gone by it's actually a far better representation of his ability to design shoes and put colorways together that he has such a varied catalog or like a you know he's not just he, he didn't just try and repeat the success of the nike 10 he did try and do something a bit different he did try and approach the dunk a little bit different with this addition of these kind of hiking type laces on the top which i think were worked pretty well in this model for some reason even though again i don't associate dunks with any sort of outdoor wear or any sort of hiking or any kind of adventure or anything in any sort of way unless adventure to you includes going to flat white and buying a really you know overpriced flipping scarf from acne or something these don't really spark that for me but he did actually make them like that and also i feel like they're one of the more versatile and easily to interpret um, sneakers in terms of your wardrobe that he probably put out in a long time and uh, judging by the amount of people that I see wearing them day in day out with just regular fits I definitely think he kind of smashed it with those ones but for me no nah, not really I never really liked them obviously the black and silver ones are flipping amazing the first ones but I think they're the most limited edition ones the ones that are like all black with the silver he's kind of classic sort of like Virgil Abloh's um, colorway I think black all black silver swoosh with white laces but the dunks I'm not really a big fan of so I'll kind of skip those keep that one moving and then I think there's some more images here hopefully it's the one is the one I'm sure I'm waiting for okay so hey there's not no more images I thought there was a Jordan I thought there was a Jordan in here as well this is him feature I think this is that was that his house or that was that the Dieter Ramos the Dieter Ramos house I think that's maybe Dieter Ramos house but yeah iconic picture here with uh if I'm not mistaken this is a supreme if I'm not mistaken this is a supreme what you call it why right? um uh what would you call it a supreme box logo that he designed i'm pretty sure is that the story behind it the one with chief keys i'm not sure what the story is behind it or is it something that was never made i'm not too sure but if someone knows i forgot the story behind the whole chief keith box logo that he has everywhere um but i thought all oh, this is pretty cool but if i'm not mistaken wasn't there more wasn't there like a, a jordan if i'm not mistaken that someone pictured also or was it only them maybe it was just those let me just see if another one design has any more oh yeah that's the one yeah see there's like a furry shoe too so whatever this is this is courtesy of design so whatever this is there's another shoe here also so as you can see with the air force ones there's loads of interesting colorways of shoes here that we can see obviously most of them are louis vuitton um things i love this colorway here it looks like captain america colorway this is absolutely brilliant right for sure oh man where, where, where'd it go where'd it go okay cool let's go back there i don't know what i did that for go back but this captain america colorway here is definitely one of my favorites there's one here with the Ghana flag on the back of it, which is fucking hard body. If you know anything about Air Force Ones and, you know, with the flags on the back, you'll know what that means. There's this amazing one here down below that's all been furred out, which looks flipping special. There's another one here with the Lakers colorway with the, um, which has kind of been given that thing that he did with these Air Force Ones where he kind of give, it kind of made it look like it's a mid that's been stuck inside of a low. So there's always excess material, if you can see here. Right, it kind of looks like there's two shoes being put in. It's like an Air Force One low, and then there's a mid that he's kind of looks like he's cut the top of the mid off with scissors and sort of just chucked it on on the inside. I love the look at that that gold number. If I'm not mistaken, that came out right. There's like a gold foiled LV logo number. There's a nice one here in terms of the blue, red, and pink. Also blue, black, and pink, which kind of makes me. Oh, actually, there's another one here. Let's skip that one. This this is giving me um, uh, Marvel Wolverine kind of bait you know type logo feelings on that one or collaborations so i kind of skipped it once again because my fat fingers don't do anything right I go back again i love this one at the top here this is beautiful it's the lv collaboration and it's got a solid pink bright bright pink sole and the up has been obviously done with um the lv monogram i think they look really really special and some other bits and bobs here too like the white with the black one is obviously really nice and this one also but i've oh look at that there's a really cool one there last one before we move on look at this this one's really nice also 
this one with this tip. I don't know what this is, where the inspiration came from, but I like this. It's got like a pink midsole with this very interesting like blue and pink like design on the tip of it, which looks really, really cool. It kind of reminds me of an old Hirachi light or something. I really like the look of those. Those look really, really, really nice. But what an inspiring expression to be a part of. And the amount of work this guy was able to do in such a short space of time is crazy. These are the shoes that he's designed from the ground up. I think the first kind of signature Virgil Abloh design shoe which unfortunately he didn't, you know, wasn't around to kind of see um, it launch or anything. But I do like the look of those. I think they're going to be surprisingly popular. Um, but I do like them because they kind of remind me of my favorite um, division in Nike, which is definitely ACGs or condition gear. So they're definitely giving me Lava Dome kind of style uh, vibes. I like that he's got the addition of the classic kind of Virgil Abloh color in the black with the silver. See that one there? That's a classic color. He does it in every single shoe. And then you've got different variations of it with like a translucent uh, mid, um, swoosh there and everything else. I don't look at those. And you've also got the Air Force Ones here, the new ones that he's put out that look really cool also. It feels like they're like an upgraded model of a Air Force One mid. He's kind of taken a classic Air Force One model and sort of added a really rugged outsole on them. Um, change some of the proportions on the upper as well. Change the materials instead of making them translucent here and there. And yeah, they look really, really fantastic. I can't wait to see some of this stuff in real life. And hopefully we get some of this stuff showcased in London because it seems like they, these things visit everywhere else apart from flipping London. And there's a cool little sound design scape here as well here, designed there. I'm not sure if that's designed by, but that looks absolutely amazing. Imagine seeing that in a club. That reminds me of uh, the Paradise Loft. Um, all, all the Loft days, right? Where it was all about kind of um, the sound and it wasn't necessarily about the DJ. So you'd be able to kind of make these crazy bespoke sound systems. People would be sitting down, just chilling, listening to music. And it was just one turntable, no mixing included or whatnot. So you could really be a bit more creative in terms of how you displayed and set up your equipment. But that looks fucking beautiful. So can't wait to see more of this going forward. And like I said, I hope we can see um, these type of exhibitions in London sometime soon because that would be flipping awesome to really see that really, really well. Cannot wait to see more. But yeah. Um, R.I.P. Virgil, big up the exhibition, looks really cool out there in Miami Art Basel, hopefully we see more of it going forward, hopefully we see more of it going forward. Next up, quickly wanted to type, talk, 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 type, talk about this because I think this is really incredible and in general I think this is a really good sort of example for the kids coming up nowadays and even for me it's definitely something that's super inspiring. Um, seeing that I kind of know this guy from afar um, and I've kind of seen his journey from I'd say the inception all the way until to this point where he's essentially building himself up to be like a mod you know a modern version of Giorgio Armani with extra added bits on top which is pretty cool to see so this is courtesy of High Part and it's regarding Samuel Ross the founder of a Cold War presenting his first solo art show right solo art show at the White Cube in Bermondsey and if you've never been to the White Cube gallery in Bermondsey let me tell you it's fucking massive it's huge it's an amazing space an amazing building but it's huge so the fact that this guy has got enough work of the level and the quality to warrant having a solo show in Bermondsey or sorry the White Cube in Bermondsey says a lot about him really really does and it's a real good sort of testament to um his talent um, his perseverance, his hard work, and all this malarkey, malarkey, malarkey. So let's read the article. A Cold War founder and designer, Sammy Ross, has announced he'll be presenting a solo show at the White Cube, Bermondsey, South East London. The forthcoming exhibition will look set to explore the collapsed landscapes and force optimism that the Black Diaspora, especially the Wayne Rush generation, people that arrived in the UK from 1948-1971 from the Caribbean, has experienced in post-modern Britain, placing emphasis on sculpture, painting, and additional elements of sound design, furniture, drawing, and fashion. Informed by his studies concerning the class system in Britain, Ross addresses the uncertainties of Black London through abstraction, uh, reduction, industrial process, and the motive for the sup supine body. If I was being slightly critical, well, I'd say if it was me, and I was able to present something like this and I've been kind of, you know, you're trying to break out of the pigeonhole. You don't want to be defined. I would go out of my way to not present any fashion. I would just leave that to the side. If I was Sammy Ross, I'll just say, you know what? I'm going to put my, I'm going to lay down my marker and show people what my powers are really and present to you an entire exhibition of fresh new ideas that are completely devoid from anything that you know me about, that, that you know of me. Don't get me wrong. The, you know, the fashion 
the sound design, the furniture, the drawing. If you're a fan of the Cold War, you will know there's always been those themes tied in, right? They've been in- intrinsically tied. If anything, he's probably he's probably um uh he's probably kind of pulled back a little bit from it. Um, even though he was kind of, I think, the master of kind of in, in kind of weaving all those things together, especially for somebody that isn't, you know, formally trained or anything. But if it was just a classic exhibition, especially in a place like the White Cube, I would go out my way to just leave all the clothes and the fashion to one side. There'll be nothing on there. Everything else would just be presented in what you'd expect to be presented in a contemporary art gallery. Loads of sculptures, um, you know, loads of art, loads of art in terms of photography, for, uh, paintings, in terms of prints, um, in terms of installations, all that stuff would be good, but the fashion, I'd leave it to one side, if that was me. Is it possible to summarize the opportunity to bear and express the history, memory, and open emotions and experimentation within such a forum, right, Dr. Ross? This week will always be an emotional book, will always be an emotional book. What? Sorry. This week will always be an emotional book. I have have found... Let's go again. This week will always be an emotional ball. I found expression through these mediums to be the best way to deal with, comprehend and pay forward and accept the passing of a mentor who was so dear to me. He continues referring to the late Virgil Abloh. All that we was as a generation of artists must stand, must filter through our medium and our voices. Samaras Inside the White Cube, an exhibition at the White Cube, Birmingham will run from April 5th to May 21st. 2023 and the fact they're announcing it now is absolutely cool so you can actually get ready for it and stuff but big up sammy ross um this is a part of him as well uh this exhibition said uh, he says he on his instagram account honored and humble to exhibit at the white cube my solo show with the gallery will focus on the sculpture painting and elements of sound and soft work will be included it's impossible to summarize the opportunity to bear the express your memory open emotions and experimentation within such a forum and obviously the pictures have we already seen here with some of the pieces that he's done prior and an amazing headshot that's going to be included there oh he's an actual doctor that's amazing okay well done to him um that's pretty cool to see also but it's going to be great to see this all in real time and present it out there but it's going to be absolutely amazing but yeah big up sammy ross and everything that he's doing and what i wanted to touch upon as well this is what i think this is kind of maybe understand something because i remember when i was working with him from afar for a project i was doing for this online fashion school um that was specifically centered around streetwear that's kind of the thing that i was kind of leading and helping to co-create um the entire curriculum which is absolutely hilarious right i've got no teaching background whatsoever but i was able with the help of my um other guy that i was working with to put together some this really rich and incredible curriculum that helped out quite a few people i know some people maybe didn't find any value for me but i think it did kind of help out a lot going forward in the whole thing but one thing i remember kind of taking away from meeting sam ross when i met him for the first time um was that he was very purposeful about making sure people knew exactly what he was about and he was very clear on that and i think that was a time when i was a bit more i'd say shy about the things i was into shy about presenting it shy about shipping it shy about showcasing it and he was very steadfast in kind of letting it be known what he was trying to do who he was eventually going to be and how he was going to do it and i feel like with him when it came to even the way that he spoke you know sometimes being you know overly worthy for the sake of it in my head i felt like or for the way that he presented his ideas maybe being some people would describe as being extra being theatrical or having a lot of pizzazz around stuff and maybe not having no substance in the work but now when things are starting to click and his work is starting to because i feel like at the, there was a moment in the beginning where maybe the theatrics were sort of up here and maybe the work was down here but the interesting thing i thought about him was that it reminded me a lot of what i thought kind of classic streetwear was or let's not just streetwear like classic elements of like cut and sew right? you know, when when that cut and sew wave was sort of like an evolution or the next step up from streetwear the whole idea behind it was that hey we've been doing the streetwear thing printing our designs on these t-shirts on these aas on these hanes whatever it may be now we want to go a level above and we want to find the exact cut t-shirt that we like to print our t- graphics on so what you do is that you start doing cut and sew so you'd go to a pattern cutter or to a tailor and you'd kind of craft your own template or your own mold or whatever your own base whatever it may be of a t-shirt of how you liked it whether or not that neck hole was a certain diameter whether or not it was the shoulders how they dropped whether it was the sleeves or the body if it maybe had a bit of a it kind of maybe stuck out a little bit on the side like a little t-shirt like a little triangle shape whatever it may be that was a kind of next evolution but 
the idea behind it was that we don't have the resources to do like that on the full thing, but we're going to do it in certain pieces. So I feel like when Sam Rose was presenting his stuff, I felt like even though his work wasn't maybe where his theatrics were or where the kind of performance aspects of it was, there was always an intent behind it. And it was like, hey, once I get some funding, once I get some, you know, some help, once I get some, you know, experience, this stuff is going to catch up. But this is where my mind's at. And it took some time, but eventually the work became on par and now he's to a point where it feels like he doesn't need all the bells and whistles and theatrics anymore he can just present and it's all well and good but you look like some of the old shows you know the ones where they're walking you know through these amazing pieces that he's designed and they're strewn all over the runway i remember the one that struck out to me most was when there was this cube and this model came out burst out of it and it was covered in red paint that kind of performance you even you think back to the old school um died and sprayed uh, Air Force Ones that he did and how that evolved into a Nike collaboration and what the kind of genesis of that idea was going forward. That's pretty sick. And the guy isn't that old, if I'm not mistaken, right? 1991, he's what, maybe early 30s, maybe if that, if maybe just turned 30. So imagine the amount of work he's got, you know what I mean, to go um, going forward. And he's got the same level of kind of hustle I even mean, hustle is a word, but it's a kind of a trite word to say. He's got the same work ethic um, and discipline and professionalism when it comes to his work and when it comes to his uh, practice, like uh, his mentor, Virgil Abloh, that you can't imagine him not going further because Virgil started, quote unquote, quite late. I think he got his brand off the mark, if I'm not mistaken, around like 35, 37-ish. So imagine if, you know, Samuel Ross started, you know, maybe 10 years before that. So maybe he was like, what, early 20s when he started doing fashion and started getting into that sort of realm. And now he's building this out forward. It's going to be amazing to see his evolution going forward. So this is pretty cool. And that's, like I said before, I think this is really inspiring for kids, myself, anyone going forward of like the limitations that you place on yourself are only the things that you place on yourself. And to always be purposeful and intentful in terms of your decisions, because similar to like, you know, when brands that come out nowadays and they want to be positioned next to certain brands, so they price themselves in a certain way and it can look a little bit um, like you're kind of offending your customer base when you suddenly come out with a $600 funnel. But I can understand the idea behind it because you want to eventually get to a point where you have your own atelier, you have your own studios, you have your own factories, you have you know the ability to like craft garments in a way some of these high fashion brands are. But at the moment, your ideas maybe aren't there, maybe the execution isn't there right yet. So, but you want to make sure the customers and the fans are like they know exactly where you stand and where you want to be next to. So you place yourself next to these big brands and these kind of designer luxury stores. And if the work is good, eventually it will kind of catch up with it and it'll get to that level. And I feel like that's what Simon Ross did as a kind of as a creative. He kind of essentially always pushed away from the streetwear thing, which I, you know, it's annoying for me because I'm obviously a streetwear advocate and I'm always going to fly that flag because it's given me so much in my life. But I can understand his kind of headier goals and where he was trying to go. And he was kind of, you know, making sure that, hey, let's put myself in a certain category. I've got this skill set. I've got this education. You know, uh, I've got this history in the game of doing stuff, you know, interning and helping out other brands and working on stuff, blah, blah, blah. And we've a project I've done on the side. And this is kind of where I'm trying to go. And like I said before, he's going to probably end up, with, you know, all things, things, all things, with all things being said, he's probably going to end up being like a, you know, like a flipping, like a flipping Giorgio Armani on steroids, for sure. Like with added bits and bobs onto it. So it's going to be, you know, I mean, like a, those kind of collections that you see year in, year out, just churning out, you know, incredible looks, evolving a tiny bit every single year, but always providing a certain level of quality and, you know, and prestige and pristine and just whatever. Like you, I'll just see it happening, especially with these fan base too. You think of how young they are and how they're growing up with a brand in real time. I think it's going to be really cool going forward. So, yeah, I can't wait to see that when that does happen um, in April of next year. In April of next year. Going on with that, talking about Cold War, I want to quickly talk about these amazing converses that he put together also because if ever there was an illustration of how incredibly creative and out of the box a Cold War is and what they do, I think these are legitimately one of the best expressions of it. Because if you look at this shoe, I think it's pretty much impossible to look at this if you had no idea what the shoe was prior to or you had the title wasn't there. There's no way that you would think this was a Converse. No way, shape or form. It looks incredible. And if you can't see this picture, it's essentially looks like something you might see from you know any number of fashion brands out there. But it's essentially like a sock type runner with a lace that goes through the middle of the shoe 
it's all kind of felt like a some sort of a one piece design very sleek with this really exaggerated heel i oh, sorry it's a really exaggerated outsole midsole type of garb and it's got like a speckled type of design i'm assuming here which is kind of a sail with some bits of concrete gray you'd say with the logo a cold wall there but it's a very futuristic type looking of design but you would never imagine this being a converse so i just love the ability to take such a classic silhouette like a converse or whatever or no to taking a brand like converse and kind of essentially pulling it kicking and screaming into the 21st century because it's sort of like the reverse of reebok kind of it feels like reebok are sort of struggling to get people to care about anything other than their reebok classics and maybe their courts and maybe the c reebok and all those other things they try and put out there make people buy but are terrible but converse have the luxury of being able to have people be super happy with their converse highs their lows and some of their skate you know lines and stuff because they're essentially iterations and edits of the same sort of silhouette they don't really go you know i think they've, they've got a slip on that looks like a skate slip on but essentially they all kind of occupy the same sort of space but they've also got the ability to take chances with stuff like this with the recovering collaboration the cold war collaboration they can take some chances and try out new silhouettes try out new styles um you know add on top of stuff they already have in the works because it's a great way also to introduce people to a new silhouette if they're not really you know um ready to invest in buying a pair of converse that look like this maybe stamping um or maybe having pulling in a cold war and using their kind of you know stamp and their appeal and their taste level and aesthetic to kind of sell this maybe makes more sense but i just love what it looks like as a shoe i think it looks absolutely brilliant really really good and they come in both colorways they come in this kind of white saily type colorway um which kind of has if you look really closely bet there you kind of have a faint logo of the converse one star here at the back which is pretty cool i love that um because essentially it looks nothing like a converse one star whatsoever and then you continue on here you've got this other color which is even better i think and it kind of you know it reminds me of this colorway i'm not too sure if this is the inspiration but it sort of reminds me of the kim jones nike collab from ages ago i think i don't know if you remember these but these are really nice and i wish i flipped them was able to get a pair i never actually did manage to get some but they were amazing they were like a okay it's not it's not this one it's not this vault i've got this other one here on screen now let me show you it's not this vault air max 95 which are pretty cool too and again kim jones has got that canny ability to do this sort of stuff because he essentially comes from the there you go i found it he comes from the same place that i do in terms of being obsessed with streetwear and then using that to parlay into fashion if i'm not mistaken he's very familiar and friendly with the guys who used to run hideout and stuff so it makes sense he's able to put together a flipping stellar stellar F, um mx95 i didn't even recognize the mx95 that he'd made has got an icy sole at the bottom of it holy smokes is that available let me see how much did they go for on StockX. because that shoe is absolutely incredible i forgot how nice it is it's going for see this is what i mean about sneakerheads nowadays you sneakerheads out there you are so boring right if this shoe is only 100 and flipping 80 dollars and you're out there buying the same jordan one every single flipping release come on man have a little bit more creativity and inventiveness when it comes to shoes that you want to buy so if I did want to purchase these in a let's say 10.5 which might be my size nowadays because unfortunately I don't fit into a UK 10 you know clean anymore like I did in the past but you're telling me they have a pair available that I can buy for 250 that is crazy I need to put this on my list I was waiting for the thing to load properly but that Air Max 95 Kim Jones total vote is apps sorry total vote if you haven't seen it is really 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 nice so let me just add these to my things when it loads let me add it now because that looks absolutely splendid I'm gonna oh I'm gonna follow the item so I know when to purchase these when I end up getting some pee but yeah let me get the 11.5 and add that to my list but these look absolutely incredible and like I said I didn't know they had an IC sole either they look really 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 good so let's go back and I'll show you the ones that I think the Cold War ones are kind of based on, if I'm not mistaken, because they're really an underrated shoe that didn't really get the props that they probably deserved. But uh, Kim Jones collaborated with Nike, and I think I don't think they're an original shoe that he designed from the ground up. I think it's just a retro that he ended up being doing, be able to do a colorway for. But it's these ones, 
the LWP. That, what are you? Air Zoom, LWP, Kim Jones. There's two colorways. There was this, there was a purple version also, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's the version there. See, that's the color. So if I go here, Kim Jones, Nike, LWP, we should hopefully see the purple version also. Was it purple? Oh, no. Okay, it was black. My bad. My memory is so horrible. So I guess those, these are the colorways that came out. So that a Cold War Vault type colorway that I just showed you there from the Converse reminds me slightly of these. If I see there, it reminds you a little bit of those. Where's oh, this one, right? Don't you think so? There's, they look, they look kind of similar. The sort of colorway and what you kind of went for. Maybe that was the inspiration behind. I'm not too sure, but regardless, this Converse thing looks great. I also like the fact that he didn't do what a lot of designers will probably be tempted to do, where you kind of add the brand name along the taping here on the neoprene sock section right i guess that'll be really tempting obviously you know maybe with the massive a uh, cold war sort of like look you know it also reminds me of this i uh, like this sort of attack might be applied do you remember that gun that everyone was using for a while there was this gun that you could buy that was essentially like a um i don't know how you printed it actually but essentially you could input text into it and it would print on a t-shirt like you know kind of you know print words and stuff and people were using that for a while to do little one away um you know presses of t-shirts to you know, for a private view or for a little project they were doing as well so maybe that kind of reminds you of that kind of print and i think it's the same sort of gun that you use if you're working in a factory and you want to label a box you kind of use it and it kind of just runs across so you kind of have that kind of digitized sort of vibe so still Maybe with those big ACWs on the side, you don't need to have a code written on this taping core. I guess the point, but I still think the the resistance to do that is great. And there's lots of tonal hits as well that I like here with this kind of you know embossed on the side, the logo here, which is really cool. Um, there's a bit of text towards the back of the hill, which may be a bit excessive, but I don't mind to be honest. But overall, I love the shape and I love everything about it. Now, I'm gonna read here. Is this actually a Converse One Star? An all star, or is this actually it's a different shoe? Cool, that's it. It's a Converse Geo Former boot. So let's see if this actually looks the same because I don't actually know if this base model is actually the same thing, but he's just maybe added a zip onto it. Let's see what it looks like. Um, so okay, is this the first time they've put it out? Maybe it is because I don't see anybody else selling or showcasing a pair of them that just look plain, quote unquote. You don't necessarily see them, do you? What we will see here when we, when we click them online is we see Converse um geo former boot and all we see are the ones that are cold all done and obviously this this one also is really nice as well the classic one star that they put together i don't see any other version of them that doesn't look like a one star so that's a bit strange isn't it um what is this off-white chucker did this actually come out i don't remember these but yeah so these look pretty cool regardless um it says here We've now taken a close look at the first two colorways launching in the futuristic silhouette. Intended to be an avant-garde take on the classic Chuck Taylor All-Star. Okay, cool. There we go. So it's like an updated Chuck Taylor, essentially. That makes a lot of sense then. Um, so I, I wonder if the other versions of this, when they do come out, the, the, the sort of essentially the GR version, if they'll have these just regular with laces. Or maybe there are laces underneath this. I'm not too sure. Anyway, continue to it. it says intend to be the avant-garde take on a classic Chuck Taylor All-Star. The boot sees technical uppers matched with a chunky geometric outsole available in vault or lily white. The outsole sees speckled rubber with um, angular color placements and given a boot a depth that's often found in bodywork of exotic car. For more snug fit, the Geo Formula employs a mixed neoprene upper with stretch and replaces the laces with a front zip okay so it's no laces just a front zip sweet um so if you've got fat feet like mine you might have to struggle in these but we're going to give these a go branding can be found all over the boot um the cold war converse gr former boot set to retail for 150 dollars oh it's just what i mean what how are new balance getting away with selling us the same shoe for 250 pounds every single flipping year yet converse can sell us something like this for 150 dollars like why well, go on for this man um, it'll be available to purchase on a cold war on December the 17th, followed by Converse and Sec Retailers Global on December 20th. Bombarated. I'm a fan, man. I love these. I think it looks absolutely banging. And I think there's some, as I said, there's some cool images of people wearing them. I think there's a shoot with um, Lancey Foe where he's got them on, right? If I'm not mistaken. Is there, did I see him there somewhere? Is that him there? Okay, it's just a model, maybe. Okay, cool. But regardless, I like them anyway. I think they look sick. I'm a big fan. Definitely would rock these. If I had to go for a colorway, I'd probably go for the that that vault colorway. This they look look wild in it. Maybe in terms of like what I wear, the whites would come better. But I think that vault black colorway is like smacking, 
smacking. I'd love to wear these in the dance at a rave. You know what I mean, all black like this. Do, 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 do. Big boy steppers. But yeah, these look sick. Really big fan of these. Um, when they drop, I shall be attempting to cop. But hey, let's see. And just before Christmas as well. So let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see, let's see. Moving on quickly, I want to touch upon this courtesy of RA. And I think this is a really interesting story because if anything, it's a constant reminder of how difficult it must be to navigate the dance music or nightlife scene when you're uh, from a somewhat, I wouldn't say marginalized community, but you're from a you know niche community, especially when you're present, representing for the queer LGBTQ plus folk and you eventually create a party that's good enough where it kind of garners the reaction and the reception and the love and the adoration from normies like myself and straights and stuff. And eventually you get to a point where you lose the essence of what you originally began, where you originally started with, right? Use the ethos, the idea, the principles, um, the community, whatever. It sometimes go by the wayside and usually involves money, right? Other investors come in, they have their own, you know, wants and needs that they're going to place on you. You might have to make some, con you know, yeah. And then you might have to make some compromises, it just really is an upside down, backwards and forwards thing. And it's kind of kind of a thankless task, really. It's sort of like you've got two options if you start a night or you start you start a club night, um, you start a label, you start whatever it may be. You've got two options. You just keep it self-sufficient and you use it to service your local community, service your friends, inspire those around you, inspire future generations and just have it like be a grassroots local thing. And any money that you make from it, you just plug it back into the business and help to kind of keep the running costs going so you don't have to kind of be out of pocket or you kind of build it to where it kind of can come to a place where you can attract investors and you essentially relinquish some of the control and some of the um way that you do things um to whoever's investing or you make some compromises in the middle but there is no in between there is no ability really i've seen so far because i'm a big believer in like not selling out but i'm also not naive enough to to realize that getting the money to from commercial work in order to kind of you know go and do your stuff that you actually want to do is the greatest thing like i think of fashion i think of all the major because it happens a lot in fashion industry like some big time photographers and stylists they'll essentially pay their rent uh, large chunks of their mortgages or whatever it may be by doing commercial work like working for a gap um you know a h&m a zara whatever it may be but then they'll use that money to sustain themselves, but then they'll do all the stuff with 032C, ID Magazine, Days of Confused, basically for free in order to kind of get some cool ideas out there and to kind of keep your name popping. So you do all this kind of corny, lame stuff with the high street brands that you don't really, not necessarily proud of, or it's not necessarily that creative, but then use that money to funnel it back into your quote unquote underground local stuff that you actually care about. And then that, ironically enough it's going to get you the attention of more big brands so you can keep that cycle going but in dance music or in nightlife it doesn't seem to be the thing as soon as you take the money from the overground it completely devalues and sort of um uh ruins whatever you've built in it's just a kind of you know it's just a thing that happens all the time we already saw the reaction with people um, with festivals here in the uk that have been bought out or invested by live nation and stuff people are already getting nervous and shook and stuff so i think it is definitely an issue that's kind of plaguing nightlife that people haven't necessarily figured out a way to kind of combat just yet and this is another example of it which is quite heartbreaking to be honest it says here local queer collectives urge manchester festival homo block to take a genuine feedback on board courtesy of ra five local queer collectives have released a statement addressing the concerns surrounding manchester festival homo block which i've heard of myself yeah, but i've never been to in a final statement shared with resident advisor high hops outlined a list of concern raised by artists and promoters employed by homo block the brainchild of a long-running queer party called homo electric um the statement has been supported by meat free tough act and members of all hands on deck and love muscle those are probably some of the best gay centric names i've ever heard in my entire life meat free tough act um all hands on deck and love muscle absolutely brilliant the concerns um include poor pay for local performers a lack of transparency surrounding charity donations and festival ties to saudi arabia <laughs> right this is beyond selling out this is like it just goes against everything you probably stand for who oppression of lgbtq rights is well documented via affiliation with the warehouse project 
Saudi Arabia's public investment fund, the IPFI, has a stake in Live Nation worth one billion. Live Nation owns shares in the warehouse project. So, by extension, any artist out there that's essentially, you know, espousing a woke ideology out there and really trying to put it to the man and, you know, have all these stances they're taking on social media, using certain hashtags. If they're essentially having their gigs powered by or sponsored with or enabled by Live Nation, you're essentially being a hypocrite, right? Because you've got, by way of their investment, you've got a very oppressive regime that basically goes against everything you stand for, essentially invested in your show or monetarily gaining from your show or from your fans being there so it must be such a conundrum to be to you know to kind of figure out if you're an artist like where do you draw the line bamba bamba and it quotes while of course any club night needs to make money homo electric decided to work with the warehouse project to produce homo block in effect employing many of the businesses um employing sorry many of the business models um a number of concessions and the site of the community they're meant to be serving for profit the warehouse project is highly lucrative and successful business and as such is uh, is of course set up to make money that's why they have such a high ticket and drink prices it's why they have such an incredibly early um final entry times and that's why they employ a restrictive exclusivity clause for the djs i get all these concerns but there's no need to trash flipping warehouse project like i don't understand this idea that we have in dance music where these things can't live um where everything can't but it has to be so many different divisions and everything has to be the same like you have to be able to appeal to the general public so the person who wants to just go to a party at the warehouse project and be able to you know eat some stripping street food on the outside drink some overpriced you know drinks and be amongst people who are okay that would smoke and lights all everywhere they should be allowed to do that also but if you want to go to maybe a more underground establishment where they maybe have door pickers and which basically means if you pay you even, even if you pay it doesn't guarantee your entry they may have a strict dress code they may have wardens and safe spaces inside of the place it may be a particular thing that's very hardcore in terms of leaning more so lgbt i think both places can coexist you don't need it doesn't need to be an either or i don't actually like this idea that you know for whatever reason people in dance music don't have any capacity to understand why there should be a need to have major big ticket kind of corny normie clubs out there for the normies like they also need to party and have a good time and if anything it's all in the same sort of ecosystem i think if those places thrive the underground that we all love thrives also but you know maybe i'm just an idiot or an, or a naive optimist when it comes to that sort of stuff it continues we think a queer event of this size and involving this much money in our city should be predominantly run by and on the feedback of queer people who live this every single day in our community. Just because a gap in the market exists doesn't mean it should be exploited and filled with people who have no experience of growing up LGBT. Welcome to capitalism. If there's a gap, people will exploit. So that's a little naive. It continues. The statement also stresses that the criticism has meant to start a conversation, initiate change, rather than simply be an attack on Homo Electric it's too late now in follows another statement from high hops um posted by last tuesday november 22nd which raised some of the many concerns for the first time Ari also spoke to the founder of another queer dance music crew about the way in which the number of collectives were misled in promoting the debut homo block edition 2019 now this is the cunty side of it this is the real cunty side listen to this the DJ and promoter who asked to remain anonymous said promoters were across the UK were approached by Homo Electric and asked to share promotional material for the new festival via social media. The source said that they were asked to do so under the pretense that they would be performing at Homo Block. Honestly, this happened to me also. So I, I really do um, sympathize with this. I've happened to me many times. I've had the whole classic thing of being booked to play in some Soho party somewhere. You're meant to bring people down. The party doesn't maybe go as successfully as a promoter wanted it to because they wanted to employ you as not only a DJ, but also a ticket salesman. Then you're meant to get paid your £50 that you're going to use to get yourself a flipping the impressive burg on the way back because you had a terrible set and all of a sudden you can't find the flipping promoter anywhere in the club and they've completely disappeared i've happened to me many 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 times so it's the same sort of kind of scumminess where you have to promote stuff and you don't get your money i understand or you don't even get to play that's something awful it continues but according to the source when the lineup was finally released late weeks later many of the collectives weren't on the bill 
It felt like they were using the clout of the local queer nights to establish a brand. People bought tickets thinking people were going to see their friends going to play. Um, there were also absolutely no mention that it was going to be a collaboration with the Warehouse Project. And in hindsight, that felt very disingenuous, which is definitely what they did. They definitely should, for sure, I can imagine. If you're going to do a festival or a big event to, of that kind of scale, and you also want to have the core group of people who helped to found that scene to be a part of it because if not what's the point of throwing the type of event like that you get them involved and the provider that they're going to be able to play in this sort of thing which is essentially a real privilege also because it means hey i was here supporting you guys when you were you know doing this thing in a warehouse somewhere and we we're running the power for a generator and now suddenly you're able to do this massive event that's in a commercial building where you're having to have staff and stuff it's really legit so it's great to see this evolution but little do you know warehouse project and the Saudi government are slipping, slipping those guys a little, you know, brown envelope under the table. In a statement sent to RA, Home Electric founder Luke Cowdery, aka Luca, sorry, aka Luke Una, um, addressed some of the issues of the joint statement. <laughs> he basically said, look, we're going to continue doing this thing because I have staff to pay. It basically says here, on working with the warehouse project, he said, um, he said they did so to help with the considerable advance work, production and risk that an event like Homer Block brings. He also stressed that Homer Block had raised close to 100000 for charity for the last two events and that there were 200 fully paid, mainly local um, LGBTQ plus artists and performers involved in this year's edition. The funny thing about these sort of statements when you're kind of trying to excuse yourself, you don't try and bring up charity, try and address their concerns. But... If you're some of the people who are protesting or kind of throwing your toys out of the pram about this, you're in a bit of a predicament because for sure you have friends who are working on that show, right? Who are working on that festival, who are part of that whole thing that's going forward. And those friends are probably hoping that that event is successful so it can continue year after year. So you've essentially got a guaranteed bit of work and a guaranteed bit of income at a particular time of the year, every single year. So you're a bit in a predicament. Do you keep pushing for this change and get to a point where there's enough social media outcry that people like the warehouse project or whatever it may be don't need to blow back all the hassle like you know what we were doing you guys a favor because we wanted to be a part of this thing we don't really need this and just wash your hands of you and pull away and now suddenly you got all these people out of work who are part of the community that you're serving but they don't maybe you know maybe they chose the money over the principles who knows but who doesn't matter but you're in a bit of a predicament if you keep pushing this you're going to risk you know taking money out of the pockets of people that you know and love or from the same community as you and if you leave it alone it might grow into being you know um the time warp of like you know of like the lgbtq plus scene <laughs> and then now you're there sitting there thinking bloody hell, how did they get to this so it must be a weird place to be a part of it continues here Sam Candle, co-founder of Warehouse Project. Look at his statement compared to Luke Una, right? He's just like, look, I'm just here for the vibes. He says here, the Warehouse Project's role in the event is to support um, from a production perspective and to help them to realize their vision. We're able to share the physical infrastructure and some of our core team without without which the event would not be viable. Build as a queer block party for all. Homo Block has been running for um, at the 10,000 capacity at Mayfield Depot since 2019. Homo Electric was one of Manchester's favorite queer parties launched in 1997. See, that's what I can understand though. Imagine you are with these guys since 1997. They maybe had a particular kind of ethos. Maybe they espoused certain anti-capitalistic rhetoric on social media. Maybe some of the artwork was very politically charged, very socially, uh, you know, um, maybe socially aware whatever it may be and then suddenly here they are in bed with live nation you know by proxy then taking money from the saudi government which is obviously completely oppressive to everything that you stand for and definitely against it and now you're in a conundrum you're in a quagmire what do you do read the statement below blah, blah, blah. we're not gonna read this whole statement but i don't know i just i feel sympathy for both sides i feel sympathy for the people who were sold a lemon and kind of hoodwinked because I've been hoodwinking myself coming up as being a, you know, a, you know, a, a pretty unknown uh, DJ and trying to make my way forward. You kind of always kind of end up in situations where you essentially get scammed. And I've also got sympathy for the people who are running Homo Electric and which evolved into Homo Block because after a while, if you want to do an event a festival that services 10,000 people, you're going to need to make some money. You can't be running these things for free. There has to come a point where money needs to be kind of passing through the till so you can afford to pay people. And much like what happened in Berlin during the lockdown with the pandemic and stuff, I remember reading loads of articles about people when the first maybe 
when the first restrictions kind of were lifted slightly, whatever it may be, certain fa- certain managers and owners and bookers for certain clubs were essentially um, bittersweet because they're like, oh, it's amazing that we're being able to reopen because we can obviously, you know, um, make some money and obviously be able to service the local community, put events back on and be out there. But a lot of them were saying things that I saw loads of people from various places, not even only Berlin, like places like Cologne and Dortmund and stuff like that and Munich and whatever they were saying. But in the process of all this lockdown and stuff and all this hysteria and COVID, they've lost many, many great employees. And for the most part, you would imagine, especially places like Berlin, where the you know nightlife is a really big deal over there. People take it really seriously. The staff members are part of what make these spaces amazing, right? I've been to places like Paloma Bar, for instance, in Kreuzberg, and that's another good one where all the staff are great and they're really friendly. Maybe because it helps because a lot of them are English, especially the ones I bumped into down there. You look at places like Same Heads as a good example. The early parts of Bergheim when that first opened was like that. Also, Trezor was like that. Also, there's always people that work there that you kind of see every week weekend if you're a regular that make that place what it is and they kind of add to the community side of it so if you're a place like homo block homo electric you've got those people they form the basis of what you're doing but then you also want to inspire and further the message that you're doing to many many more people and that will obviously going to invite some normies and invite some general public people also and just to i'd imagine just to run an event like that and to run a festival like that, day festival, whatever it may be, the production cost involved, especially in a place like England, where I feel like, you know, for whatever reason, this country is very much against parties and the fun and stuff. So you're having to kind of go around so many obstacles and it probably helps to have a partner like, like Nive Nation. who have maybe some people who work in local councils who maybe have some, you know, stuff to do with kind of legislation, whatever it may be. I'm sure those partnerships work with doing those kind of boring office backroom you know bureaucratic type stuff and they will definitely help as well so you're kind of a bit of a quagmire do you keep servicing a local community and essentially bleed yourself dry over a very slow period because you can't make any money but you're being true to your scene or do you take the money from these big corporations to allow you to continue doing what you love in the process paying people um for their work and for their time um especially during this you know period in our lives now we're in a flipping global recession it's a really really tough place to be in and i don't i, I don't I, <laughs> I don't envy anybody in this situation i don't envy the people who are you know um fighting against this um link up with live nation i don't you know i don't flip in envy anybody involved in homo block and trying to basically i should reassure people in your community that you're doing this for the right reasons it's tough it's really it's tough but like i said i've seen it here already in london we have the same situation that happened prior to crossbreed shutting down that king party there's sort of the similar i think thing will happen mostly with places like you know inferno maybe budokai maybe won't have the same issue because i guess maybe because it's a mostly a queer type of event i feel like those events for some reason always have a bit of a ceiling i don't know why that is particularly but it seems to be a thing but for some reason the lgbt um themed kind of nights with you know quote unquote the gay nights they always tend to have an appeal that can kind of far supersede where they sort of started from. I think of some, you know, a collective DJs like Horsemeat Disco. I used to see those guys playing in places, you know, warehouse spaces in Shoreditch and shit. And now they become, you know, global stars and whatnot. And I'm assuming if they did do a party, which I don't know, they did, yeah. Horsemeat Disco used to do a party at the Vauxhall, right? That pub down south. I'm sure maybe there's part of their community that are feeling also that maybe things have changed now the bigger that they've got. So, I'm assuming it maybe might happen with the collective out there in Berlin, right? That Cox Del Moore group, they might be having the same sort of issues also going forward. Maybe they might have the same thing where an investor comes along and is like, hey, we want to take your party and take it global or make it more, you know, regular and consistent or put it in a certain sort of space, whatever it may be. There are all these kind of troubles and all these kind of hassles you kind of have to fight against, you know, every single day. So it must be really hard to deal with. But, you know, sympathy goes out to both sides. So I hope they work it out and reach a amicable conclusion because the last thing I want to see is anybody lose their jobs because that's absolutely lame. Then I also wanted to touch upon this news courtesy of Mixmag regarding another new club opening up in London. It feels like for some reason we have these little um, periods in London nightlife where a bunch of clubs will close, then a bunch will open, then a bunch will close, a bunch will open. My theory is that there's a lot more spaces free now, especially in the post-pandemic world, that are essentially in limbo because you know that that two years that we were all basically you know flat on our asses and stuck inside basically push back any sort of development or any sort of redevelopments and new builds and whatnot 
and I'm assuming some of these manufacturers and materials people whatever they may be that were tied in and contractors to do this type of stuff probably took on other bits of work so it probably put a pause on some of these projects that they were going to do here in London so a lot of these uh, landlords and maybe local councils and stuff have recognized a dip in some of the income that's coming through and just think of even parking ticket fines have probably gone down considerably in most places because people are not driving around anymore they probably sold their cars and not coming into the city or into the town or into the main strip anymore as they used to in the past there's not a lot of outside tourists coming in either maybe it's stuff to do with brexit i don't know what it is but i'm sure all those factors come working in conjunction have basically allowed these councils to be a little bit more relaxed in terms of allowing landlords to you know put forward like you know temporary flipping licenses and whatnot or maybe be allowed them to convert these empty spaces into quasi nightclubs or whatnot because i've seen a lot of that stuff happening the cause has got a similar space that they try basically using around the corner from where i live which is um it's like it used to be an, an art gallery and now they've kind of turned it into a club bar record shop type thing so i wonder if there's something going because for the longest time it felt like they were very strict and stringent and very tight and rigid in terms of the spaces that they allowed you to use for a club it's all felt like you have to you have to take over an actual club itself but it feels like nowadays you can find an empty space like an art gallery or like a an ex news agent and whatever maybe got it out and turn it into a space that you can do with certain events here and there and make that work for a short period of time so it's pretty cool so anyway courtesy of mixed mag brand new nightclub opens up in south london called the ton of bricks which i love because it reminds me a little bit of what i said prior about um the Shannon Abloh article from the New York Times magazine where she said Virgil Abloh used to say to her that he loved her like a ton of bricks I think she got that tattooed somewhere in her wrist or something so that's what immediately made me think of it but I think the is maybe a bit worthy the ton of bricks maybe just call it ton of bricks that'd be absolutely amazing right ton of bricks is amazing but yeah let's go down it says here um the new nightclub is set to open up in Brixton this weekend from the teams behind Brixton Jam and Percolate. Oh my God, this is nice because I played once for at the Brixton Jam bar pub in South London for the open Dex thing and it was flipping fun. I had a great time, met some really cool people who I ended up, you know, being quote unquote friends with on Instagram. So that'd be awesome if I was able to get an opportunity to play there again. Who knows? Um, but continues on. And obviously Percolate, if I'm not mistaken, they're a house label out here in London or the UK and they do a lot of few nights as well if I'm not mistaken, also. Continues. Opening for the first time on Friday, December 9th, the Ton of Bricks on Calder, what's that, how do you say that? Cold Harbour Lane will feature weekly programming and adds to the new London venues with a 24-hour license. So similar to what we have here in um, in Eastwood Fold, they're going to be able to open until 6, I'm assuming, or some time, on some occasions they'll be able to stay open from like the Saturday to Sunday, which is absolutely amazing. The club, just a short walk from Brixton Station, officially opens its door for the first time this Friday with a one-off Keep Hush event taking place tomorrow featuring Mixtress. The official launch party welcomes the likes of Hammer and Malika and Crywood and Faria on Friday, while Saturday sees David August performing a solo DJ set. Incredible. It was the beginning of 2019 when we first laid our eyes on this site, the Tunnel Bricks person Instagram, a venue with a 24 hour license in a buzzing part of Brixton. I'm actually going to go. I think I'm going to go this weekend actually to go check it out because I don't actually go to South too often. I think this might be a good opportunity to check it out. But, you know, it's going to be annoying because I'm going to take an Uber back and it's obviously going to be flipping 30 quid or something. But I'm going to I'm going to go. I'm going to check it out and see what the vibe is saying. Now, almost four years later, the, after the pandemic, no, four years later, featuring a pandemic and the planning hell, we are days away from being able to share what has been working on for this time. We'll be announcing our launch events later today. Also, they already were working on this prior to the pandemic, but I guess the pandemic put a hold on it and now they're launching it. Pretty cool. Um, the first names of this session, this season, sorry, events have been announced, including Otik, Bluetooth, um, Tosiki Ota, Melly D. Parallel and High Hops Takeover, which I mentioned prior. Uh, we'd like to announce our upcoming weekend of shows. They said in the following post on Thursday, starting next Friday, yes, next Friday, we'll be opening the club every weekend as we test our space with music from friends, new and old. Entry for each party currently scheduled is free for the first 50 tickets sold on first come, first serve basis. Check out the first run of shows at a ton of bricks here. And if you check out the Instagram, I want to see more of the inside and what the actual club looks like. Um, got here you've got some i guess sound insulation i'm assuming here with some windows i'm not so sure what the space is looking like how big it will be um what else have you got you've got another one here with loads of wood so it'll be a quite a warm feel to it maybe that's wood maybe that's decking i'm just sure if it's up or the down 
I'm not really too sure about this. You've got some exposed brick because that's a quintessential London nightclub, right? Um, exposed brick wall. We love a good exposed brick wall. We love it. And a good little bench you can probably sit on and stand on and, you know, throw some shapes as you're drowning yourself with your Jägermaster and whatnot. Um, someone says, yeah, there's a club. Okay, I don't know what this was. There's a club called 414. What's that? Is this where 414 was? Yeah, the former 414 building in Coast. Okay, cool. What's Club 414? I don't, because I don't go to South London. I don't know any idea about these places down there whatsoever. Let's see what Club 414 was in Brixton. I've never heard of it. Okay, so it closed in 2019, this place called Club 414. I'd never heard of it in my entire life because I'd never ever go to South London. So this is what it looked like on the inside. So we've got a kind of an idea of what it kind of looked like in terms of the space. So it kind of looks small in terms of capacity but i like that because it's going to be a nice intimate space the sound is going to be bouncing off of the walls and it's going to be an absolute vibe yeah i'm looking to for to go i'm definitely going to check it out let's go back to the instagram again and check it out so we've got that it's a blue on the outside there and then we've also got this picture here which features some artwork i guess or print they're going to be putting on the outside oh no this is some flies obviously showing with the event on friday hammer uh, with Mali Mal Mal Malaika, Crywood and Farah, Kaima, Kyle Parsley and Madeline. And then on Saturday, they've got David August, Ty Lucum, Claudia, Pure Vinyl, Wasted Space, Sunday, Millie D, all day long. So yeah, Melody, sorry. And then another picture here with some more inside clips. You've got Function One speakers, obviously. Some nice lighting on there as well, cool design. You've got a picture here showing the sound. I'm assuming let's play that. Oh, some LEDs on the back. That's nice. That sort of reminds me a little bit of Fold. You know when the you know when the the, the blinds go down, the light kind of spins through, and they've got these little I think coloured sheets that sort of bounce the light through. So it looks like a kaleidoscope. You got these little LEDs in the back. Okay, cool. Let's see what it looks like. I'm eager to see what it looks like when I go on the inside there. Check it out for sure, for sure, for sure. So that's the ton of bricks in Brixton. A new bar, Intimate Nightclub in Brixton, opening night of December. Uh, we've got a list of actually, let's see all the events actually listed on RA also to take a little peek of it and then we can move on. Yeah, keep Hush event happening tomorrow. So that maybe have give us some more of an insight. So I'll definitely be, you know, creeping on the old Instagram to check out what the inside of it looks like there. Or maybe I'll just surprise myself and just go and see what the vibe is saying. David August event and I think I'll probably end up going to this event on a Friday just to see what the vibe is and mix it up from my usual East London haunts I go to but it's a pretty much a stacked list of events that they've got there already all tied in there which is pretty sick pretty pretty cool I like it 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 from the team from the Brixton Jam and Percolate all doing this together it's going to be nice to see the actual they've got a website also let's see the website what that looks like I they got anything other bits of information yeah there you go collaboration between Brixton Jam and Percolate a ton of bricks coming December 2022. Cool to see. I love it. I'm a big fan. Big, big fan. Can't wait to see it when I go there live. Well, I can't be a big fan if I haven't seen it yet, but you know what I mean. You know what I mean. That was the Axiom Singing Show episode number 627. Thanks again for tuning in as per usual. It's been a pleasure to have your company. If you want more information regarding myself, you know what to do. Go to my website, axiomzinger.com to see all the information regarding me, social media, flipping links and email links and stuff. You can email me on there as well. I've got some DJ live streams happening hopefully soon. So keep an eye out for that. I'll obviously be uploading my or updating, sorry, my YouTube channel with reminders as to when that will be happening. But I'll definitely keep you updated on this end as well when I end up doing those. And yeah, man, nothing else to kind of comment on. Thanks again for tuning in it's been a pleasure to have your company and i'll see you guys again soon peace 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 <laughs>